Bonsoir, bonsoir, bonsoir. Bienvenue. Good evening, good evening and welcome. I see all of you. It's great that we're all here. We were a little bit, we were a little bit frightened last week, as you know, all of you know. But in the end, we see lots of people here at the show, lots of people at conferences on different subjects. So we reassured this event took place and you are present here. So the people had to make real efforts to come there to change their plans at the last minute. So it's really fantastic that you made it here. And thanks again heartily for coming. So some of you are discovering this exposition for the first time. Some of you are faithful visitors. Is there a simultaneous translation going on? Okay. Yeah, okay. Some are hearing it, some aren't. Je disais, merci, merci d'être venu. Un certain nombre. I just want to remind you that this region uh, has three big priorities, youth, jobs, and the ecological transition. I think you have to be aware of this, that there are lots of commitments have been made by the region, transportation, uh, high school education, and the ecological transition at the heart of our priorities. So it's a strong engagement the summer of 2023. It's a summer for ecology for all of the region, for our, all our skills that we have to have terms for ecological transition. So for 2050, that is our horizon. And we have two big objectives. First, we want to be an energy positive re region in 2050. Second, it's to be a carbon neutral region by 2050. This is going to raise a lot of difficulties for us, in particular because the region is attracted and we'll have to welcome 800,000 people by 2050. Uh, there are 3.8 million people here. 800,000 or more is fundamental. So uh, it's fundamental for economic act, economic activity, and that's going to be an issue for uh, uh, energy consumption from the point of view of these two big ambitions. The first issue is to try to avoid, is to rather reduce energy consumption and the greenhouse effect in two big areas, which make up this uh, greenhouse effect, building 
and transportation for building and construction. I won't talk much about it. That's not the heart of today's discussion, even though we're here together. We for ecological transition, we're attached to the subject, but it will be part of the renovation projects uh, uh, with reduced uh, greenhouse emissions. And as for transportation, this requires propriety. And I'm proud to say that with the Paris area, the second million flag, in terms of uh, diminishing greenhouse gas in transportation, also we have a big mobility program allowing us to reduce energy consumption. Also, we have the changes in the very system of energy production with three main areas which will enable us to reach carbon neutrality and also first of all offshore wind farms and we have the first wind farm it's the biggest one in france that's near saint nazaire second one the third one and the second one it's, just, it's we have photovoltaic energy and and, and it's regrettable because it's not as popular the, 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 it's not more of use but this is linked to the Ukraine crisis and the third. Third is biogas, biomethane, representing in 2050 20% of energy consumption in the area. The oil region, and this is much greater than 2021. So, this is really exponential growth. And so, we were going to be very much involved in this. And we have a problem which is conjectural, namely uh, profitability of biogas. I won't go back to that. You already you know it better than I. And the second is the knowledge of the population about the supposed reported uh, impacts of biogas. And I think our partners have to anticipate. I think this initiative on with biogas territory in reality. And it's unfortunate that. Uh, it's, uh, by 2000, it will be difficult to reach the objective, and, uh, and this is, uh, applies to a lot of renewable energies. We have a lot of work to do with our partners. Our partners are helping us for energy transition. This has to be done uh, also by biogas. At the end, we have another issue. We ha have a lot of ambitions there. and. And uh, hydrogen, and, and uh, I, I attended an event on hydrogen last week, and uh, this is for hydrogen, we have a lot of goodwill, and there, is, is, there are high, high, high hydrogen initiatives in the Pays-Lenoir region, they're very well uh, mobilized, and they're in a good position by comparison with the rest of France and Europe. So. We have, we, have, we have to be really at the forefront, at the cutting edge, and, and also in collaboration on biogas, hydrogen, electricity, and, and mobility. And uh, this is an excellent show, lots of contacts, lots of business, and see you later, and see you next year. There we go. Uh, well, Matthew, Matthew uh, come to the stage. Um, good uh, evening. Um, I prepared a speech and I threw it out after half an hour up here, an hour here at the conference, and I thought I had to do something else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a couple of words that I prepared, and then we're going to show, I'm going to show a piece of the Ice on Fire film that we did uh, three years ago, two years ago, three years ago. Um, it's a long film. It's a 98 minutes. So I'm going to cut I cut together a couple of pieces that I thought might be interested for you guys. Um, and then afterwards, we can speak a little more. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer any questions you might have. But for now, I um, welcome to the biochar effect uh, in the making. It's not made. It's going to be made. <clears throat> Um, but first, I want to shout out uh, to Paul and his incredible team to put on this fantastic exposition or expose or exhibition, as we say in English. And thanks for having me. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so we're a production company. Uh, we were based in L.A. Now we're in New York. And we make films with really big subjects <clears throat> and what we consider super important and super relevant, super global like ice on fire, if you've seen it, you understand. And so 
When I say to my team or friends or anybody that knows me that I want to make a film on biochar, I get sort of this, what? Um, I say, yep, I'm making a film on biochar. And then I explain to the folks why. <clears throat> and what I say is that you guys out here sitting here are onto something really big. You're like American size big. Um, you are working for the future of mankind. You are initiators. You're like the Jedis of the great biotransition. You know, you, you think about the transformation of biomass while you're tinkering away on your machines and your, your, your apparatus. You think you want to reverse climate change. You want to suck every C13 out of the atmosphere that we put up there. Every molecule. You care about restoring land. You want to restore ecosystems. You want to grow better food. You care about soil and water and the air. And you care about animals, what they eat and how they live. But you also are concerned about our waste. Odd combination. And you want to find ways to unwaste us in our societies. And you see something valuable in something valuable in any waste heap, no matter what it is. You're brilliant geeks. I found out you're geeks and you're nerds. You know, you're technicians, you're genius farmers. You have morals, you care about stuff. And you truly understand, each in their own way, the transformation that is about to happen of the materials. You think about new economic structures. Do you even know what that means to the outer world, that you're doing all this work here? <clears throat> you are a bit chemist. I found out that a lot of you are chemic, you, you understand chemistry. You're technicians, like I already said. You are engineers, you are mathematician. And that's really what makes you guys great. And you demonstrate a pathway, a showcase to true circular, circularity. And that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to explain to people that it actually works. Because most people, you know, the circle stops halfway. <clears throat> and like I said, you demonstrate pathway to show, show circularity. You turn waste to value. You basically turn shit to black gold, as I like to say. And it's, it's amazing. And carbon that is, especially biochar, will be used eventually in all materials, in all aspects. It will be used. It's not now, but it will be. And we need to have the confidence that, that happens. <clears throat> you know how to ameliorate materials, and you want to have the planet catch a breath. And your social awareness, blah, blah, dot, dot, dot. So after I tell people that that's what's going on in behind the scenes of biochar, do you guys think you have a story to tell? Well, I think you do. Now, are you telling those stories? And do you need those stories to be told? I would say yes. Then why don't you do it? Why isn't there a comprehensive stories about the bio job, about the bio transitions, about waste to value? Well, I, I can't find anything decent on the internet or anywhere. Why isn't this story to be told? I don't know, because maybe you can't tell the story. Maybe that's not a part of who you are. So when I met many of you guys, what emerged was, hey, I'm a filmmaker. Why don't I make the story? So what was born, and many people here have seen the Biotrad uh, Effect presentation, is to make that film. I want to tell the story of the great biotransition from ancient sunlight to from ancient sunlight to the present sunlight to present biocircularity. I want to bring complex, disassociated concepts into one comprehensive and exciting narrative. We did that with Ice on Fire, and in a minute I will show you that. This is not without challenges. Prince Biochar is a very misunderstood being, even bewitched and thrown in with the, the arch enemies of fossil fuel activities. <clears throat> Pyrolysis process is not fully understood by the mainstream, and therefore the waste to value is important. Uh, the waste to value is impotent. When I explain that this wasteful material is transformed and becomes medicinal, 
I lose everybody. That is the biggest story about. In the middle is a process, it's transformation. And on the right and the left side, between feedstock and the halo effect of biochar, and this goes for, for other things too, it, it, it is not put together. This is a story that has to be told just by itself. So I'm taking these disassociated concepts and I'm putting, I'm trying to put it together. <clears throat> Now, and this is what I'm saying, who believes that a nasty piece of waste can become medicine? It's like the ugly duckling suddenly turning into a supermodel with a cause. We need to show how it's done and change the perception of the world. We have to change our perception and we have to change our thinking if the biotransition is to be successful on a wide scale. <clears throat> there are also a lot of enemies in the powers that rule the land, which is the fossil fuel. And the enemies don't come out and shut you down. They create laws, they create by things that you would never hear, you'd never see, but they affect your activity and they affect the biotransition on the large scale. And I could speak hours about that. <clears throat> now we will do our best, Stream Media will do our best to make a film that you can be proud of and that you can show and share with the world to show what you have to be part of. This film, and sorry I have to do this quickly to make everybody, because I'm getting this question a lot, this film will cost about a million dollars. We usually don't touch films under 1.5 at Tree Media. That's just how much it costs to make a film today. I'm bringing my, personally, we're bringing a half a million to the table as in-kind services. Um, we are committed to make the film with all the necessary accessories, bells and whistles. If you make films too cheaply, we call them YouTube films, then they're great, they're informative, but they, they lack the quality of the jewels of the, composure of a crown. I always say the documentary film is like a crown. It's like something you can wear, something you can be proud of. <clears throat> and that just takes a certain amount of people that bring their skill, their abilities, and their, their brilliance, really, a composer, a, a, a animation to, to the table, and that just costs money. Um, we already, we already have, uh, and this is what I wanted to say, we have signed a phenomenal cinematographer, actually the one that did Ice on Fire, to the project, and I want to thank especially the Rainbow Bee, Bee Eaters uh, people and company who quickly and selflessly cut me a check for 50000 so I can do that. I will reach out to important people and to our celebrity friends to support the film, but be before we do anything, before I can do any of that, because people have asked me, the film has to be funded. Now, we recently funded up a film that we're doing, and you can see it at my booth, called Legion 44, which looks about the larger biotransition, um, especially the drawdown technology all over the world. And that was funded by private hands. Now, why do we do that? Um, we fund it because if we fund it through a network like HBO or Netflix, the film is locked up. You won't have access to it. You can't show it, and it's just it's just locked within that universe. And we would like to make something from for the people. I mean, I'd like you to make something by you because I cannot make a film without you, for you, and all the people that need to see the great work that has been done, um, and the people that you are. Because I'm showing a film that where I don't just show the technology and the the concepts, but I want to show the people behind it because it's really about people. A young generation is interested in what this person went through to get to where he is, not the, the size of the catalyst or the horsepower of the engine. Um, it's all about authenticity as well. So I'm asking, for, I'm asking the companies and the private people that sit here for your support. Like I said, I need, I need $1 million to do that. Um, I've got some pledges. I'd like to walk away with at least half. So if, if you are open to sponsor it, please let me know. Come to my booth. Um, and thank you for your time. And now I'm showing you a couple of clips of, to show you a little bit of what, we, uh, what I'm about to do with um, the biochar effect, uh, ice on fire, and then afterwards shoot, you know, shoot away and ask me questions if you have. Thank you. Over the last 250 years, we have, in effect, conducted the largest science experiment in history. 
at this critical turning point, we must give a voice to the impartial experts who have presented us with the facts they have spent a lifetime to uncover. It is their time to be heard. They are the scientists, researchers, and innovators who have found the solutions to preserve the very life of our shared world. There's a couple different projects that require manual sampling. So one of them is the long-term CO2 record. And the way it's set up, you still need a person to come physically take the sample every Tuesday. I'm the person that gets to go in the snowcat to take the measurements. We want to keep that long-term record going the way it's always been taken. Monitoring and tracking what we're doing to our atmosphere is a serious and difficult endeavor. For the last 50 years, dedicated researchers from around the world travel weekly to the same locations, taking samples of greenhouse gases that cause climate disruption. So we're at about 11 and a half thousand feet on Niwot Ridge in the front range of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And this is uh, NOAA's long-term CO2 sampling site here. It's the third longest in the world. So uh, these are the flasks that we're gonna use to collect our sample made out of glass. And um, after we're done today filling them with air, we'll ski them down to our office and then we'll take them down to NOAA's office in Boulder where they get analyzed along with similar flasks from all over the world. When they took the first sample in 1968, it measured 322 parts per million. And uh, I mean, we don't know what this sample is going to measure yet, but it's probably going to be around 408. So it's a little bit of an increase. <laughs> and now I'm just putting everything away um, and getting it ready for next week's sample. One of NOAA's missions since its inception was to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other gases that affect the carbon cycle. Those gases are carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, molecular hydrogen, nitrous oxide, and sulfur hexafluoride. This system runs five days and five nights a week, 24 hours a day. So what I'm doing right now is putting the air samples on the manifold and start the measurements and then I can walk away. all over the globe. I fished in Gloucester, up in Newfoundland, and then I was in the Bering Sea for a bunch of years. And, you know, that was the height of industrialized fishing. We were tearing up entire ecosystems with our trawls, chasing fewer and fewer fish further and further out to sea. So it was completely unsustainable. In fact, a lot of the fish I was catching was going to McDonald's for their fish witch sandwich. It really caused a wake-up call for a lot of folks in my generation. I was actually out in the Bering Sea and the cod stocks crashed and you know thousands of people thrown out of work cannery shuttered and it really taught me that you can build up an economy and a culture over hundreds of years and if you don't protect the resources the ecosystem collapse can wipe it out in a matter of years and that's when we really begin to realize that issues like overfishing like climate change that they're not environmental issues for a lot of us that work on the ocean there are economic issues. I mean, there's going to be no food, no jobs on a dead planet. 
people when I realized this wasn't sustainable, I went on this search for sustainability. I remade myself as an oysterman. And what, the, what oysters taught me was that Mother Nature created these technologies millions of years ago designed to mitigate our harm. We don't need advanced technologies. Mother Nature has seaweeds and shellfish, which sequester five times more carbon than land-based plants, filter 50 gallons of water a day per oyster, pulling nitrogen out of our system. I mean, my job as a steward of the ocean is to take Mother Na Nature's technologies and grow them. And that's, it's pretty simple. You know, the volume's stunning. We can do 10 to 20 tons of kelp per acre, 150,000 shellfish. And you scale this up, if you were to take a network of our farms totaling the size of Washington state, technically you could feed the world. If you took 5% of US territorial waters and farmed in our style, you could create 50 million direct jobs and sequester the equivalent carbon of 20 million cars. Our farms also help mitigate acidification. The kelp creates something called a halo effect, which reduces the acidity in the oceans, which then allow our oysters and other shellfish to grow thicker shells and not be as susceptible to acidification. So I, I mean, climate change was supposed to be this hundred year sort of slow lobster boil. And instead it's here and now. Luckily, as fishermen, we can transition to something that keeps that core. So to have the pride of helping feed my country, and that's just so exciting. I can be part of, you know, the army that's gonna help um, hopefully save the planet. And biochar is very much like coral for the soil in that it can hold nutrients, it can hold water. It's more of an architecture. It incubates life. You're saving about half of the carbon that's in that plant and then can put it to better use and sequestering it in soil for great benefit to, uh, to agriculture. I am the biochar project manager for the Redwood Forest Foundation. We're sort of at a, a perfect storm right now in California where we have over 100 million dead trees in the Sierra and we need to do something with that. Biochar can definitely uh, be one of the ways that we address the beetle damage and the, the dead and dying trees in the Sierras. Biochar is essentially the form of charcoal that is suitable for use in agriculture and in helping to build more healthy soils. Je vois que la réaction est positive, je n'entends pas d'objection. D'accord, le tarif pour le climat est accepté. C'est accepté. There's only two things you can do about the atmosphere. You can either stop putting greenhouse gases up there, or you can bring CO2 back down. That's it. And you can do the first one by conservation, energy efficiency, and clean energy. And the second one, to photosynthesis, whether it's on land, on farms, on forests, phytoplankton, help in the oceans. There's only two things you can do. So that actually sorts the tree simply. And passé, in the past, what has been done in terms, in terms of solutions is that it's focused on energy, 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 energy. and the reason for that is understandable. So it makes perfect sense to stop putting that CO2 uh, up there, CO2 excepting that in the process of emphasizing uh, clean energy, renewable energy, solar, energy solar propre, wind, etc., it sort bien, of occluded the rest of the solutions. Pas solutions uh, toujours. The purpose of drawdown is to see if the 80 solutions that we had modeled would scale 
to the point where we could reverse global warming within 30 years, going from reduced to reverse. But you bend the carbon curve, what Dwaran shows is that we have choices. And that if we increase the rate that we're scaling some of the solutions, then we can achieve drawdown at 2050. And if you say the odds are long, I agree. They're long odds. I'll take them. If we take all this material out of the deep freeze, you very likely get large CO2 and methane emissions on a huge scale over which we have no control. I study methane emissions from lakes. Now, every time I go to a new lake, I attempt to light these gas pockets because it's a very high concentration of methane. It's highly flammable. We see a positive flame test when they contain methane. So it's a quick gas chromatograph on the lake to tell us, do we have a methane lake or, or are we dealing with a, a different kind of lake? There are many new lakes forming that were not here 30 or 60 years ago. And those lakes have 10 to 100 to 1,000 times more methane than the rest of the lakes. They are a picture of the type of methane emissions we expect to see in the next 10 to 50 years as permafrost warms and thaws. And that permafrost feedback cycle kicks in and, and really accelerates. So really what one needs to ask is, are there positive feedbacks within the system? The answer is yes. So it just stands to reason purely by common sense. The less you disturb it, the better off things will be. We have the solutions at hand. But the question still remains, can we mobilize and take collective action before it's too late? It ought to be obvious that the biggest research effort the man is involved in should be to develop direct air capture methods that work. If we do that, then we can save the world. And so why don't we do it? So um, maybe it's obvious what I was trying to say with the, oh, the center. I never liked the center. And in school, I was always put in the back because I was so tall. Um, so it, it's, it might be obvious what I was trying to say with the clips. Um, the, the person who goes up the mountain, nobody knows who she is. And she does it every day. And she creates the data. The data is not a conspiracy theory put together by some liberals um, and then thrown out in the marketplace so we get all scared. It's, it's hard work and it's authentic and it's meaningful. And I think that's one of the things that as filmmakers, we as Dream Media, we value that. That's what is interesting. That's what's interesting to our audience is to see the people who are behind um, the scenes who are doing the work. Um, in the other scene, of course, I did kelp. So you see how much CO2 that kelp is really not related to drawdown and people, um, but it absorbs huge amounts of carbon. Um, and then, of course, biochar, Raymond, Baltar in, in, um, in, San, in, in the Northern California region. Uh, when we made this film, so a film takes 18 months to make. When we started making this film, so really the film started in 2016. Nobody was talking about Drawdown. And we got into so much trouble, um, or put it this way, we got attacked or we got like, what are you talking about? This is, you know, renewable, like like Paul Hawkins says, it's energy, 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 you know? Um, 
now we know we have the confidence to say no we understand what is going to happen in the future we have a bit of a foresight it's one of our strengths we're we're looking where does an idea go in the long term because if you follow any idea if it's a lie if it's the truth if it's authenticity it as like i said it has long legs it it goes far anything that doesn't make sense or is short short term it dies and so we do that as an exercise at tree media to come up with um, new ideas the biochar ideas has very long legs and i think can go very far so it's worth a film <clears throat> any uh, any specific questions It's okay if you don't. <laughs> so th this is an interesting conundrum we're in because what we were trying to do, we were trying to tell the stories through the eyes and this is also what I'm trying to do with this film. We want to tell the stories as authentically as we can through the eyes of the people on the ground. Um, so when we did Ice on Fire, we were looking around for technology that we find could be scalable because scalable is an issue um, in the new world. You know, we, we, we make beautiful things at home. We make a beautiful chocolate cake, but can you make that chocolate cake at cost for a larger audience? And can you keep the value up and can you keep, keep the ingredients in? So, so similarly, we're, we're trying to um, pick out people and ideas that transport something. And, and what they transport is not just what they're doing. Oh, I'm the CEO, I developed this, but what did this person go through and what did the experience? And some people can tell that story better. Other people have an issue with that a little bit and they just, they're just great stewards of their jobs. When we pick like Climeworks, we pick them because they were the ones you know, they were pretty small at the time. And because of my German background, I, you know, I called them up and I said, hey, would you guys to be, they were very gun shy um, because they were attacked a lot. Um, and I convinced them that we're making this really great film and, and which wasn't made. And, um, and they could be in it and they could, they could not promote, what's the word? They could stand for their technology and share what they really believe. They have a big audience for it. And, Anyway, so after the premiere and after, you know, um, Ice on Fire went to Cannes and a couple of festivals and got a lot of, you know, accolades and, and praise, the, the Climeworks had a much easier time to raise, you know, the money that you guys all know they raised. Um, because it, it went, the story went to a certain, and this is why I called it, so I said the sort of a film is like a crown jewel. When, you've, when you're in, not in the film, but when you, have a film available of that sort of largesse and then it helps the whole it's like the water lifts all boats and it helped them and it helped especially the conversation because i don't know how you in in what situation you're in often but you might have to tell your story over and over and over again and sometimes wouldn't you just like to push a button and say watch this first and then call me back yeah so that's another reason why a film needs to be it can change the direction of a story that you cannot do by yourself. And the film is very successful for HBO. And they, we, you know, they originally wanted a different film and we said, we don't wanna make a negative film, we wanna make a positive film. No, people don't like positive films in the industry. They want, they want you know, conflict and lower shock or stuff, which I get, I like, I like good action films, thrillers and stuff. But we're not going to pretend that we're going to die any moment um, to make a film and then come out of it by a few solutions. So we did what we did. They actually liked it a lot. They left it alone, you know. And um, but but making films with with streamers and making films with larger companies is always is is restrictive, you know. It's, uh, and uh, yeah. Are there a uh, last question, maybe? There is here, Craig. Um, 
Matthew, I think it's fantastic what you're doing. I think all of us do. What's the timing and what are you hoping to do with this if everything runs the way you want to do it? So um, a film has several um, sort of phases. And the first phase is the pre-production or the development phase. The film has been fully developed. Um, and that, what that basically means is we understand we want to make a global film. It needs to be 90 minutes and above. Um, it needs to have a certain feel, look, and stature. Um, and then a part of that is who, who will finance it. We've, we've created a lot of films that weren't financed. Um, who will finance it? And then you go into pre-production. And pre-production is basically you cast, you want to get the right people at the right places showing what you guys are doing, not talking about what you guys are doing. The biggest thing is to find people of all ethnicities or diverse. We don't want to have a monoculture film of, and, 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 and that is sadly a bit of the problem because there's some very brilliant people that I'd like to put in the film and we have to keep it very diverse. We want, you know, women to be in it because it's also, you know, man's oriented, so male oriented kind of activity. Um, find the women in the, in, in, in biochar. We've, we've done that in, in, in Ice on Fire. So you have to do the pre-production and then you basically wait for the money to come in because you can't go into production until the financing is raised. And then you go into production, which is basically a 12, I like to say 12 months. Why? Because if I miss the spring, um, if somebody asked me to come to the Philippines, you know, it's hard to go between July and certain times or, or so. So I, I have to, I have to figure out when the activity on the ground and the season and the people are all matched together and hopefully go then. And so I might have to have a pickup job. So, oh, that's the other thing. The lake was a gift because we had the, the film finished. I came up with the title Ice on Fire way beyond. And with that, we, we won the financing and, um, and, and the film was made and we were saying, where is ice on fire? It's nowhere in the film. So we were, and, and literally we were like, films like that have, it's like gifts, like life. You know, you're in this moment, you go like, I need something. And what happened was, and I don't want to tell the story, but basically we found and heard about this woman. We literally booked tickets two days later with the cinematographer. By the way, the cinematographer is the guy that's going to do my, our film too. Um, and he, they got those shots. Now that's, you know, that's a gift. You, you can't make that. And, and even they were surprised, as you see, they thought there's so much methane, you know, and that, and visually, of course, that's what you want, you know, as a filmmaker, because you do want a little drama. Um, and then after 12 months, it, it's shot. Um, then you basically go into editing. In a documentary, because we, there's no script, you actually have to pre-write it. And then when you're on location, you have to actually write it by asking the right questions to the right people at the right moment. So there is this really interesting dialogue. And Lila, the director on this, she's a genius in that. And I'm, I'm hoping that I can live up to her, but she's close by, she can help me out. Um, and then you edit and editing is basically writing the film. You know, how do we go into the story? Um, how long do we stay on something? Where are we going to go from the next and, and everything? So I would say 18 months to the max uh, and a film will be done from, fine, from yeah. And then we're going to go to festivals um, and submit it to, we're going to submit it to festivals and yeah. And that's the other thing is I really think it's, it's the subject is, first I wanted to make look, sort of a low budget kind of really good film. We, make, we only hope we make good films. But then I thought, no, no, this could be something really big. This is something really big. I just have to make it interesting because it can be so nerdy and so technical and so, you know, not, it's not that gas, it's that gas. Nobody cares, but we cannot not care either. We can't get wrong information out there. We can't create wrong excitement. So we have to find a really way, but it's gotta be exciting because I think it's exciting. So. Okay, M Matthew, thank you very much. Thank you much for coming, for sharing your vision with us, in which we all, to which we all adhere, that's for sure. <clears throat> I'd like to suggest we, we continue the discussion, uh, but 
we can now stand up and just go around the corner here and take a glass in our hands and, and keep chatting comfortably. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> I got a round of applause, yes. Let's get a drink. <laughs>